going here. We're in Romans chapter 15. Did you find the verse this morning? Romans chapter 15. We'll be looking at verse 13 in just a moment. You know, before it was common to board a plane and cross the ocean uh, in an airplane in a matter of a few hours, passengers were uh, confined to ships to get from America to Europe, Europe to America, and so forth. And they would take weeks to make that journey across the Atlantic and other oceans. Oftentimes, during those trips, uh, stormy weather and rough seas made the crossing quite an ordeal for those who were on those, uh, those boats. And on a certain occasion, a passenger who had been battling uh, seasickness for days was clutching the rail of the ship and uh, his face a sickly green color. Anybody here ever been seasick? Not much fun, amen? <laughs> Uh, you understand what I'm saying then. The steward uh, of the ship, uh, one of the men, was trying to encourage the passenger, and he said to him, he said, Sir, don't be discouraged. No one has ever ever dies from seasickness. <clears throat> oh, 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 don't say that, the man said. He says, It's been the hope of dying that's kept me alive this long. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you just want to die when you're, when you're that sick, right? While we may laugh at that man's humor, we, uh, yet few of us, I would say, understand the power of hope. The power of hope to sustain life. And the reverse of that, when the element of hope is removed from a person's life. Nothing, you see, is more powerful when it comes to sustaining life than the power of hope. Romans 15, 13 is a wonderful prayer that Paul wants every believer to experience. Let's read it. Uh, from your Bible, read it from the screen up here as it says this in God's Word. And we just want to camp out at this one verse for the most part this morning. It says this, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. How, do you, how, how many of you like that verse? I like the yeah. sound of that verse. Amen. The, 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 first of all, we've got a, a God of hope who wants to fill you with, with joy and fill you with peace. And, and as we believe and as we trust him, that you and I may abound in hope in our lives. And by the way, we have a helper to do that, the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Can we praise him this morning in yeah. prayer? Father, we give you thanks for the word of encouragement that we find here in this particular verse, Lord. And someone here in this mo uh, morning message, Lord, needs to hear uh, a word of hope today, the power of hope, the abounding in hope that we're going to talk about this morning, Father. And we thank you that we can uh, uh, we can study the precious word of God today. And Lord, we just ask that you would in, in, in just instill us with hope as we obey what your word tells us to do here, Lord, which is to keep believing and to trusting you and, and looking to you as the God of hope in our lives. And you will in turn give us joy and peace and allow us to abound in hope each and every day. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when you read a verse like that, uh, how many of us, uh, or we should ask ourselves a question, does that verse even come close to describing me today? Am I a person who is abounding in hope? Uh, can I honestly say that my life is filled with joy and filled with peace this morning? Uh, and, you know, and by the way, when we ask a question like that, most of us tend to give ourselves a little, uh, uh, a little leeway there. We give ourselves the, the benefit of the doubt a lot of times. Oh, well, you know, I'm doing okay. You know, I think I'm all right. You know, I... Uh, yeah, it could be a little better in my life, right, this morning. But, you know, I'm better than most other people when it comes to that. But You understand what I'm saying? We, we tend to do that, don't we? We tend to, to kind of react that way. But really, the, the question would be this. Let me ask it this way. Would my family or my best friend describe me as being a person who is with all joy and peace in believing and abounding in hope? Would, would that other person see that? in your life being displayed. Now, the fact is, to varying degrees, we all kind of fall short of that, don't we? You know, uh, none of us lives there on that mountaintop all of the time in our Christian experience, frankly, and as much as we would love to, uh, uh, we're, we're not always there. But, but, uh, uh, but I believe we can all benefit then be, by thinking about what it means and how we can grow in these qualities that he talks about here in verse number 13. 
you know, I can't imagine someone here in this auditorium this morning saying something like this. Well, well I'm really not interested, preacher, in having joy or peace. I, I don't think I want that. No one's going to say that, right? Because we all want that. We all want that feeling of joy, that feeling of, you know, of, of having a good life. We all, we all want peace and, and where, where the stress is relieved and there's not the turmoil and the, and, the, and the problems there. We all want to, if you will, overflow. That's what that word abound means, overflow with, with hope in our, in, our, in our lives. But yet we always don't experience that as God would have us to so are you okay with looking at this verse a little closer this morning and seeing how we might uh, legitimately claim to be filled with joy and peace and abound in hope in our lives? Are you okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Some of you aren't too excited, but hey, that's all right. <laughs> you know, it, it's no secret that a common factor among those who are depressed is that they lack hope in their lives. They don't see a way out. They don't see a, 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 a you know an upside. They don't see a a, a a light at the end of the proverbial tunnel. Uh, discouraged people and those who are apathetic about life also lack hope. Uh, uh, depressive disorders affect uh, millions of people in our country every single year. Some as, as much as ten percent of the U.S. population suffers from some sort of uh, this uh, de depression or. So forth. You know, preschoolers are the fastest growing market for antidepressants in our wow. society. At least 4% of preschoolers have been diagnosed already as clinically depressed. They haven't even got out of kindergarten yet. Can you imagine? 30% of women uh, at times are depressed in their lives. Men's figures were previously thought to be uh, half of that, but uh, we're finding that more and more men are being, uh, you know, are, are facing the same situations in their life depression and. Uh, by 2020, just a couple of years away, depression will be the second largest killer after heart disease wow. in America. And studies show depression is a contributory factor to fatal coronary disease uh, already. Now, those are depressing statistics, right? Uh, we don't want to dwell on those very long. I realize that, that often there are complex reasons why people suffer from depression or suffer, you know, from those kinds of things, and, and certainly we're not here to offer a one-size-fits-all uh, solution to everybody's problems. Sometimes they're physical in nature. Sometimes they're, you know, they have to do with other, other parts of our, of, our, of our thought process or bodies or whatever. But, but before you turn, listen, before you turn again to antidepressant drugs, which, by the way, some have very serious side effects, Consider seriously seeking God to fill you with all joy and peace Amen. in believing Amen. so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I think this is a pretty practical verse for our society, for our day and age. Let me say it this way. The God of hope wants you to be filled with all joy and peace as you trust and believe in him. That's right. And when you do that, he's promised to, uh, to abound or send hope into your heart, into your life, that it may abound through his Holy Spirit doing his work inside of you and I. Let me say it this way. The God of what? Hope. The God of hope he's called here. By the way, this is the only place in the Bible where it calls him that. But if God says it once, that's enough, isn't it? I believe it. The God of hope desires and has made available the way for you and for me to be filled with all joy and peace and hope in our lives. Now this morning we're going to look at four things. Number one, the source of that abundant hope that we're to have, the foundation of it. Number two, the human. And then number four, the divine means for abounding in hope. And hopefully give you a few practical strategies for that as well. Number one, the source of this abundant hope that God promises to us here is, of course, in God himself, isn't it? He is the source. He is the God of hope. By that, Paul means that God is the giver of hope. He's the provider of hope. He's the supplier of hope to you and I. And by the way, God is also the object of our hope. But at the same time, he's the supplier, the giver of that hope to you and I. 
And Romans uh, 15 and verse 5, if you would, look at that verse real quick. It's on the same page in my Bible, at least. Uh, Romans 15, 5, it says this. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. You know, he's called here the God of what? The God of patience, of patience the God of perseverance, the, uh, the God of encouragement, if you will, is another word for consolation. Here, here's a God who, who's concerned about you continuing to make it through life, a God who's concerned about your, your mental and emotional well-being, if you will, in life. He wants to give you encouragement. He gives those qualities, I believe, to those who seek him. Later on in this chapter, in verse 33, he's called the God of peace. So here in this one chapter, we have four different titles for God or applications of the character of God. But uh, the one that I like that I want to focus on today, obviously, is the God of hope. And folks, if we lack hope, if you lack hope in your life today, the first place you ought to be looking is to God. Yeah. You ought to be looking to him. Amen? Amen. Right. Yeah. Not anyone or, or anything else. In other words, beat on the door. Like asking for bread at midnight, as it says in Luke chapter 11. Until God opens that door to you. And remember, biblical hope is not some uncertain, uh, uh, like when we say, Oh boy, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. I'm going to mow the grass tomorrow. You know, I, I sure hope it doesn't rain. We're going to have a picnic tomorrow. We're going to the park tomorrow. I hope it doesn't. I hope it doesn't. That's not the kind of hope it's talking about, is it? No. It's certainty. It's biblical hope is certain because it rests right. on God's character, on God's word, and on God's promise. So we can trust it. We can believe it. Notice the word hope in verse 13 uh, actually refers back to the word trust in my Bible in verse 12. Um, look at verse 12. And again, Isaiah, so Isaiah said, uh, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall, shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust, is what my Bible says. Your, uh, some versions say hope. They make hope in him, because, by the way, that word is translated 14 times in the King James Version as hope, and here it's translated as trust. Uh, it's very close words. It's a, it's a different form of, of the word hope from verse 13. Uh, who's the him of verse uh, 12? In him shall the Gentiles trust. Who, who do you think the him is? It's Jesus Christ. Uh, he, he's the root of Jesse that he's talked about there. That's prophecy. That, that goes back to the Old Testament. It's him refers to Jesus and the promise of salvation that comes to all people through him. That means that if you have not come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and put your trust in, in him as your only hope for eternal life, then you have no hope for eternity. None. What a bleak description of life without Christ. It says in Ephesians, you're without God, without hope, and without God in the world. A number of years ago, humorist uh, Dave Barry wrote a book titled, Stay Fit and Healthy Until You're Dead. <laughs> what title, right? Let me say that again. Stay fit and healthy until you're dead, right? That's the name of the book. And in that book, he pokes fun at the at this fitness craze, you know, that uh, kind of uh, in America. But but at the same time, he his, his title also uncovers the very raw truth that we all tend to want to suppress. It is 100% certain that you're going to die. That's right. That's right. Amen? I mean, that, that's, Amen. Boy, I, you say, well, preacher, what about the rapture? Well, okay, I'll, I'll give you that one. Jesus could come back and we can go to heaven. But by the way, we're also going to die at the same time when we go up with him. You know, that we we got to die because we got to get rid of this physical body to get to our eternal body. So so in a, in a sense, we're going, to, we're going to anyway. But uh, that, that truth is we're all going to die unless you have Christ as, by the way, you say, I'm healthy now. I'm not worried about that. <laughs> I'm young. I, you know, it couldn't happen to me. Go, go ahead and read the obituaries once in a while. Amen. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, I watched the news where you know a 17-year-old was going to graduate from high school next week, got killed in an automobile accident. That happened what three or four times this past May. Uh, you know, read about little babies that pass away before their time. Amen. You don't know when you are going to die. Amen. You may want to suppress that or put it out of your mind or don't think about it, whatever, but you better be ready right. for that day. It is coming. 
Make sure your hope is in Jesus Christ. And unless you have Christ as your hope, you don't have any true hope beyond the grave, but only the terrifying expectation of judgment. So put your trust in Christ today as your Savior. So if you're lacking hope, you know where to find it this morning. I, I told you, the Bible tells us it's found in where? In the God of hope. That's where we find it. He's our source. Number two, the foundation of this abundant hope is to be filled with all joy and peace. Now, Paul doesn't pray that you will have a little bit of joy in your life and time, seasons of peace, you know, that come and go in your heart, trickling through your life every now and then. No, rather he prays that God, of the God of hope, will fill you with all joy. And all peace, so that you will or can or be able to abound in hope. He piles up those superlatives to show us what God can give us and what He wants to give us. There's a wonderful place of natural beauty that's near Sedona, Arizona. It's called the Oak Creek Canyon. I don't know if anyone's ever been there. But at the top of this breathtaking canyon is a spring that is on the side of the road, at the top of the canyon road. And uh, by that, uh, by that the side of the road, you will find two spigots, large spigots that flow 24-7, 365 days a year, with delicious, cool spring water. It's an artesian well. And they've tapped into it. And people from all over that area, they, they stop there and they fill up their, their water jugs with that pure water that God has brought up from underground. They don't go to Walmart and buy water. They, they go there and they fill up their, their jugs there because it's free. Think about this. Like those thirsty seekers who drive out of their way to claim the free water that flows there, Paul wants our containers of joy and peace to be overflowing so that we may continually abound in the hope Amen. of God. Amen. God didn't want to just give you a little bit. Right. He wants to overflow your bucket. Are you excited about that? Amen. Amen. Right. Man, I'd like to get mine overflow, wouldn't you? <laughs> Listen, don't settle for an empty jug. Right. You don't have to. Amen. You don't have to go through life without joy, without peace, and without hope. Paul had already mentioned joy and peace in reverse order and in connection with the Holy Spirit. Go to, go to chapter 14 of Romans, verse 17. Let's turn back a page. Uh, I like what he says there. He's teaching us about the kingdom of God. and He, he says this in Romans 14, 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, it's not food, it's not, you know, it's not something that you swallow, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in what? The Holy Ghost, amen? So, so that's what the kingdom of God's made of. Both joy and peace are listed also as part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit uh, that he produces in the believer who, who walks in the Spirit. And as qualities that the Spirit of God produces in us, then joy and peace that Paul is talking about do not come from having a certain personality type. A person with the Holy, with Holy Spirit produced joy is not just a person with a bubbly, optimistic personality. You know, it's, uh, it's not just for them. Amen? Aren't you glad of that? Because we don't all have that personality, do we? A person with the Holy Spirit produced peace is not just a laid-back guy who never gets ruffled about anything. Rather, these are qualities that really are not natural. They do not come from being in favorable circumstances where just about anyone would be joyful and full of peace. In fact, they are often most noticeable when a person is in a situation where almost everyone would be depressed or anxious. That's when you need joy. That's when you really need peace. That's when you really need hope. And that's something the Spirit-filled believer can have Full, full joy, full peace, full hope. And I believe that biblical joy and peace is, is just really an inner delight in God and, and His sure promises that give us comfort and contentment in every trial. 
It comes from the knowledge that our sovereign God is working out all things for our good, including tribulation, including distress, including persecution, including famine, including nakedness, including peril and sword. And uh, together he's working all of those things because he loves us. And he's called us according to his purpose. Ah, you ought to have some hope this morning. Romans 8, 28. Read it sometime. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Biblical peace is the inner contentment and freedom from crippling anxiety and fear that comes from being uh, uh, that, uh, that, that we would have if we weren't reconciled to God. And as we've seen, it comes through taking every concern to God in thankful prayer as well. By prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes understanding, should keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So being filled with God's joy and peace is the foundation, or it's, we can say, the platform that results in abounding in hope. So we all want that. I hope you want it this morning. I hope you want joy. I hope you want peace in your life. and I hope you want to abound in hope. But how do we get those qualities? I mean, uh, Paul mentions here, to me, two, two things. He mentions a, a, a um, human side of it, our side, and then he mentions a divine side, the Holy Spirit side. They're involved in this. Did you see that in the verse, in, back in our text, chapter 15, verse 13? He says it this way, the human side uh, uh, means, or the human means of this abundant hope is to keep Believing. Can we say that again? Mm -hmm. The human side is to do what? Keep, keep believing. Keep believing in what? Keep believing in God. Keep believing in His Word. Keep trusting Him. Look at the verse again. Now, the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in what? In believing. As you are believing and trusting God. Now Paul doesn't specify the object of our faith, but obviously I believe it's the same object as mentioned in uh, verse 12 of Jesus Christ himself. The hope of the cross where Jesus died to pay for my sins. The hope of his sinless life that he lived for me. The hope of his resurrection from the dead and, and that he came out of that grave, which gives me hope that one day I will come out of my grave and I'll be with him forever. The hope that he's seated now at the right hand of the Father in making intercession for you and for me, believing that and trusting that, hey, God is there, Jesus is there at the right hand of the Father, praying for me, interceding for me on my behalf. He's with me each day. The hope that he's one day coming back, it's called the blessed hope in the Bible, isn't it? That one day he will return to take us to where he's at. I'm talking about Jesus and, and hope. And Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith is the substance or assurance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Did you notice that? It's hoped for, those things. That's our faith. It's believing. So, so to hope in Christ is to believe in Christ. It is to look to him alone to fulfill all of the promise that God has given to us. We find those promises in the book, in the word of God. Which is why Paul said this in verse 4. Look at chapter 15, verse 4. This is a great verse. It ends with a four-letter word that starts with H. Guess what it is? Hope. Okay, it ends with hope. So let's see how it starts. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the, of the scriptures, the Bible, right, might have what? Hope. Well, let me open my life right now. Well, how much are you reading the Bible? Probably not much. Uh-huh. Amen. Get into the Word of God. You, there's a human side, right? There, there's, there's something we've got to, got to do. We've got to keep believing, and faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And you want to build your faith. You get into the Bible. You begin to, to read. You begin to study. You see what God did for other people that, that were in desperate situations, that had no hope in their life of getting out. Like the, the people of Israel, when they came to the Red Sea, they were hopeless. There was no way they were, you know, they were going to be killed by Pharaoh's army. They couldn't get out of that. There was no escape, but they did. Right. Because they had hope. Amen. And God came through for them. He will for you. 
I love the, the way the, uh, you know, we, we talk about how do, how do I get this kind of faith that helps me abound and, and hope in the midst of the trials. And, and again, it's, we get it by, by the, reading the Word of God. And God's Word shows God to be faithful to His people in all sorts of trials. You ever, you ever read the last, you know, we all love the book of, uh, of Hebrews chapter 11, that chapter. It was the faith chapter. And, you know, by faith... Uh, Abraham by faith, you know, it tells us about David and all the all these great people of God. But then when you get toward the end of the of chapter eleven, it, he, the the writer of Hebrews through the through the Holy Spirit, he he says things like this. He says, "Who by faith, these people they conquered kingdoms, they performed acts of righteousness, they obtained promises, they shut the mouths of lions, they." Quits the power of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. From weakness they were made strong. Became mighty in, 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 in war. Put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. And then right in the middle, you ever notice he, he kind of changes uh, he, uh, the beat just a little bit. But he continues on and he says this. And others... In other words, the first part of that, he said, all these people did great things. They won great victories. Everything went wonderful for their, in their lives, and, and God blessed them and whatever. But then he says, but others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn and sunder. They were tempted. They were put to death with a sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, uh, ill-treated, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes. In the... He said, I, I don't like that second part. Do you? I, I don't want to be one of those people. Well, we don't get to choose, do we? We just have to trust. And knowing God and his ways through his word will show you that he is completely trustworthy. Even if you had to suffer a martyr's death for the cause of Jesus Christ, he will one day give you a crown of glory Amen. in heaven. Right. The other part of having faith, or this kind of faith, is to choose to believe God in spite then of those horrible circumstances that seem to be contrary even to the promises. After Nebuchadnezzar's army destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and slaughtered thousands of the people of Israel, there was a prophet named Jeremiah who was there. He had seen what was going on. He's called the weeping prophet. He began to weep over what he saw happening in, around him. But then he directed his thoughts away from from the massacre, away from the terrible things that he had seen, and he directed his thoughts back to God, and he wrote this in Lamentations chapter 3. He says, This I recall to my mind, therefore I have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not completely consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, right? He says, the Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore, will I hope in him. So what looked like a hopeless situation, he ends up writing about what? About hope in the midst. So the human means of growing in abundant hope is to believe and keep believing. Now what about the divine means? And what... Uh, uh, what, what, what are the divine means of this abundant hope? It's, it's, of course, the power of the Holy Spirit, according to our verse, through the power or by the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. He says, so that you will abound in hope through that power. Oh, here's a little thought for you. Between chapter 12, or verse 12 and verse 13, all three persons of the Trinity, the Godhead, are listed there. Verse twelve mentions the root of David or the root of Jesse, which is uh, which is Jesus, Christ, the Son of God. It mentions in verse thirteen the God of hope, that's the Father, right? And then it mentions in the very last part the Holy Spirit. In that, 
So all three are there. The object of our hope, or excuse me, the, 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 the God, the Father, is the God of hope. The object of our hope is Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Uh, the power for joy, peace, and abundant hope then comes from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the power of the Holy Spirit is none, none other, nothing less than the power of God that created the universe. He spoke and it was done. The Spirit's power is the resurrection power that gives new life to dead sinners. The Holy Spirit opens our minds so that we can understand the truths of the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is the power that produces His holiness in us and, and as we walk in dependence on Him. The Spirit strengthens us with power in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. The Holy Spirit seals you and I as believers so that we are kept for the day of redemption. Oh, thank God for the Holy Spirit of God. What a ministry He has to us. Amen. And so Paul says that here, the Holy Spirit is the power which who produces in us his fruit of joy and peace as we trust in him so that we, in turn, can abound in hope. Well, I conclude with just a couple of practical strategies in God's joy, peace, and hope. Number one is this. Begin each morning by spending time with God. Spend 15, 20, 30 minutes with the Lord. Maybe an hour if you, if you can. Spend it in God's presence, reading and meditating on His Word and praying and talking to the Lord and, and communicating with Him. Maybe, maybe you should spend it sometimes singing. You ever sing to the Lord? That's a great way to worship, isn't it? That, worshiping Him. It said that George Mueller... One of the great Christians of bygone generations, he trusted God to provide for over 2,000 orphans every day without ever asking for money from anyone. And by the way, God always provided. Yeah. Yeah. He used to make it the first business of every day, to have, he, what he called, he said, to have my soul delighted in God. <laughs> I like that. Listen, if you like joy and peace and hope, ask God to fill you. Ask him to delight you in his presence with those qualities for his glory. Another thing we can do is we can memorize God's word. We can, we can put God's word into our heart and mind and, and our thoughts and begin to, to go over verses and put them in our, in our memory banks here like this verse about hope or Romans 8.28 or, or uh, uh, John 3.16 and other verses that we, just, we can say back and we can remind ourselves. By the way, the Psalms are loaded with those kind of verses. Let's read some Psalms. Number three, the third thing you ought to do every day is confess your sins. Especially any sins of grumbling, complaining, thanklessness, hopelessness, uh, not trusting in the Lord. Begin each day uh, by, by uh, thanking God for sending his beloved son to save you from your sins. Thank him for the word, his word that he's given to guide and sustain you. Thank you for all the blessings and even, even for the trials that you're going through which are going to help you grow. 